from the dark web to your radio dial. You are listening to CyberTalk Radio on News 1200 WOAI. Welcome to CyberTalk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20-year internet security veteran. Joined this week uh, by a couple of offensive cyber experts. We're going to talk a little bit about network security and uh, how to think about keeping yourself safe. Uh, Greg and Rob, thank you for joining us this week. And can you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves, share a little of your background for our listeners? Uh, yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Greg Ake. Um, I've got a 15 years experience in the uh, U.S. intelligence community. Uh, nine years of that was in the U.S. Air Force as an intelligence analyst. And um, I subsequently met Rob while working uh, in the government spaces. And we both went to an uh, i corps uh, cohort and we had uh, pitched a project and that's sort of where we met up and and sort of you know sort of talking about what we wanted to do or you know aspirations for commercial endeavors and and that sort of started off and uh, got us working together and 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 found us to you here today. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I'm Rob uh, Rob Noeth, uh Greg's partner in crime here. Um, I have about ten years uh, in the intelligence community as well. Um, my uh, background is more into development, um, computer science, uh, doing sort of offensive uh, measures uh, for the government. And um, that's sort of where, where I came in and met up with Greg's analytic mind. And uh, we uh, founded Level Effect, which we can hope to uh, take some of those ideas that we learned and exper- from the experience that we got in the government and uh, bring it out to the commercial space. If someone was uh, to go to Level Effect, and what kind of things would they... Uh, be able to buy from you guys as a product? Our product is uh, called Phalanx. It's a SaaS product. Um, It's a software solution, so it's no hardware needed. But the main goal of our product is to provide visibility and context. And a lot of other providers say they offer those things, but context means sort of depth of, of, of data. And a lot of forensic analysts or people buying products nowadays don't have a lot of those skills and knowledge to be a forensic examiner. So our level of visibility is from the network holistically down to the endpoints and what they're doing. So it enables an organization to understand their network and know what's going on and allows them to ask smart questions about what is going on and is that normal and being able to baseline things against other uh, activities that are similar. Yeah, so if if I was thinking if I was going to run my own security operations center and I had a bunch of human analysts sitting and watching different logs and feeds and correlating things themselves... Uh, it sounds like you guys are taking some of that forward into using software to move some of those eyes off of glass, as they call it, and get folks up to higher level thinking. Yeah, that's that's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, by uh, deploying our agent, you get visibility of the network and the endpoint, like I said, and that replaces a lot of the challenges with setting up a SOC. Uh, the cost of doing that can easily get into the millions of dollars when you look at the suite of tools and software you need. So our main goal was to enable analysts to get towards the root problems instead of having to look through a lot of text logs and try to make sense of that. Yeah, I've generally told folks about three million bucks to get set up and about a million dollars a year minimum viable to operate your own security operations center. So if you're not going to invest that much, you need to look towards uh, partners to deliver that for you or you need to go through your risk assessment and just decide that having that real-time monitoring of things is not necessary for your business. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. So the... Greg left off our, our sexy tagline, which I oh. like. I like to throw around. It's yes. uh, we we I like to call it the defensive botnet, um, and the reason why it's different than a uh, like another uh, antivirus or you know another security vendor that leaves agents on the computers is that we kind of like to put the control a little bit more into the customer's hands and into the system's hands that it can reach out and do the defensive measures it needs to do instead of just popping up alerts and sending more alerts. Yeah. So I, I and uh, if you're out there listening, so we, we're going to talk a little bit through uh, some of where artificial intelligence, machine learning is heading inside of the security analysis world. Um, we had a, a conference here in San Antonio, a uh, cyber forensics conference uh, a couple of months back where I Um, I gave a talk about uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and some of these new uh, tools here. And with some of those uh, forensics investigators uh, had this look on their face like, this is kind of scary at this point. Uh, I know you guys, we were talking before we went on air a little bit uh, about this, um, but it doesn't seem like most of the industry is through to thinking about how AI and, and machine learning 
um, and deep learning or all of the different words you might use to describe having computers try to process through lots of information in um, creative ways, not just in a, a black box yes or no manner. Uh, it doesn't feel like they're getting there broadly as an industry. What are you guys seeing as you're out there trying to develop products in this area? Um, it's hard because a lot of customers are, you know, uh, the cybersecurity industry, it appears, spends more money on uh, marketing and trying to educate customers with flashy terms. So it, it's it's really challenging when you try to sell a product in that space because the questions are, are you guys doing AI? And nobody really knows what that means or, or can quantify what that, what that really does. Um, the challenges uh, with it are uh, that, that we've seen is that a lot of uh, companies are trying to use it like they did signatures of old. Um, I'm going to take a lot of data and train it to find something new, and I'm just going to say if it's good or bad. And you're not leveraging the power of the human. We still need to bring humans into it. So, you know, we're using machine learning, uh, but we're using it in a way to optimize and make humans efficient instead of taking everything away from you, giving you a black box and saying this is good, this is bad. Um, because that's how threats persist in your network, because they're going to change their TTP and your model's not going to account for that. And you've left a gaping hole now analytically in your network. Yeah. And then we have seen this over the last few decades as the Internet has risen here. You have uh, initially very strict signature based uh, systems and then those strict signature base, the hackers would just buy one and then they would figure mm -hmm. out how to bypass it. And then they went from strict signatures to fuzzy signatures or you went to um, like Cisco had rolled out a network admission control product and the, the number of years back that they basically had to, I don't know if it's end of life or canceled or turned off, but no one could roll it out in their network because um, it was impossible to operate. So productivity drops so much if you actually secure it um, with these models mm -hmm. of, of the signature based world. Um, that no one rolled it out at a at a safe manner. Um, and then if you, you get onto the AI side of these things, I mean, the hackers are going to buy the same product and they're going to run their attack through to see if you're a trained system. The same way they try to build attacks right now to get by real people staring at screens, looking at alerts and events and trying to correlate them. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a, an ongoing arms race um, from a, both the the defensive side trying to be able to keep up with what the attackers are doing, but are you seeing attackers starting to use um, AI or, or ML to try to fuzz their way past different security tools? Or are they still is that still mostly a manual world where they're trying to figure out how to bypass things? Um, I'm not uh, particularly aware of a particular instance regarding machine learning use by an attacker. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it is occurring, how that would be done. Um, it could be done in many number of ways. Um, but, but like you alluded to, it's, it's too easy to buy products and to reverse engineer it and run your, your capabilities against it to see what it does. Because you look at some endpoint protection suites that do a new next gen uh, wildcard, whatever. Yeah. Um, they have to collect data for their analytics to work, which means if you can obfuscate those collection points, your stuff runs in a different manner or executes in a different timeline, their models won't account for it. And, uh, and that's sort of the problem with that solution. So it, that sort of went into what we designed our product for. We you know, sort of looked at, uh, regardless of who's going to get into your network, if we're talking about a network-based attack, they have to communicate over the network. And if they're going to utilize tools, it has to be in memory. So we sort of focused Phalanx to look at network events as, as a tipping mechanism to then go do a targeted endpoint forensics. So we're very light on the system until something anomalous occurs, and then we dive down into it because... We went into this with the assumption that we're not going to catch everything. Um, our endpoint solutions won't see and know about everything that could or will exist in the future. So we have to go back to the common model that they're going to have to communicate. And if we get really good on the communications piece, we can go dive back in and find out really is that malicious or not and, and provide the right context to the users so that they can take appropriate action. So a mix of monitoring and then some of the uh, kind of advanced persistent threat remediation and cleaning mm -hmm. into one suite of services. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, for, for those listeners that don't know what an advanced persistent threat is, because as you said, you're not going to catch them on the way in all the time. Um, help uh, somebody in the audience out there understand when you say not catch them. They've, they're in and they may be in there for some period of time. How does that work? The... the I think the last statistic I saw from either Cisco or one of the, one of the other big guys was that uh, a lot of these APTs, advanced persistent threats, um, have on average persisted in networks over the big hacks that have been newsworthy for seven, eight months. I think before anybody caught 
caught wind of what was going on, that a bunch of data was leaving the network, you know, credit card numbers, social security card numbers getting stolen. Um, the the advanced part of, of, of the, you know, the acronym there comes from kind of the level of sophistication of this malware or these hackers or these groups, these teams of guys that are uh, going to steal. And gals. And gals, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yes. uh, people, uh, hacker people uh, that, that uh, you know, they, they have the money, they have the backers, they have the time um, to build some really complex and sophisticated tools uh, to bypass expensive, uh, complicated software and uh, defenses. Um, there's kind of like people have probably heard the term script kitties. These are not advanced persistent threats. These are the people who are kind of YouTubing stuff and figuring out how to hack and using Metasploit and things like that. Yeah. The advanced people uh, are not using those tools. They usually build their own stuff or they um, get really uh, sophisticated tools from other people who build them for them. Yeah, and th this is uh, one for listeners out there. I think one of the big changes in the cybersecurity landscape over the last, it's probably only the last five years, this has really proliferated. Um, with the rise of uh, Bitcoin out there, because now there's uh, easier ways for these, I'll call them cyber arms merchants, to uh, receive payment from their customers. Uh, yep. So it used to, to be that you had to be a sophisticated um, computer scientist, programmer, network engineer um, in order to hack into systems. Now uh, you just have to have low ethics and access to money. Right. Um, and you turn that money into Bitcoin, and then you go to one of those actual sophisticated folks that's out there just selling hacking tools and software, and some of that software they're selling, uh, completely legal for them to sell it uh, in lots of cases because they're just selling something that you're supposed to use on your own systems. They're not selling anything that um, you should be using for criminal purposes. Now, they might be selling it on a dark web marketplace, and they're taking payment in Bitcoin, so law authorities may look at that and go, you knew when you were selling it in that very shady shady yeah. market that <laughs> it was probably going to be used for shady things if you right. if it was legitimate use you'd be selling it taking visa or mastercard on a website on, on the legitimate internet website yeah yeah so you have these these arms merchants out there now selling cyber weapons to people with low ethics and now you have criminals that are able to get access to much more advanced things than they they were uh, able to 5 years ago and they're using that for criminal gain this is why we're seeing um, advanced ransomware and large-scale ransomware operations running, um, and that's not necessarily even directly employing any of the advanced um, hackers. It's just employing a bunch of people with low ethics uh, yep. and access to capital. Yep, yeah. exactly. And in the, I think another thing that kind of separates APTs from from non uh, non advanced threats is that they do their homework. So if they're if they are interested in your company, in your, you know, whatever research and development you're doing, or if they're interested in what you have in your network, they're going to spend an equal, if not a greater amount of time scoping it out before they go in and, and you know, try yeah. to get whatever they want to get. I think, I think to speak to that, a lot of people assume APT is cyber. We, we, we tie the term APT to cyber action. Uh, and I think people forget to take a step back and realize if you're dealing with a real APT, let's say a nation state, you're talking about human intelligence. You're talking about other forms of intelligence, uh, imagery, satellites. Uh, you're going to have people coming in and applying for jobs. You're going to have uh, people wanting to buy your product under the guise of a foreign company who's interested in you, all the while mining information about your internal network infrastructure and all these things. Do you communicate with foreign entities? If so, you're, you're leaving a digital trail that's used to monitor and map your network. And I think a lot of times, you know, we look at the cyber kill chain and that sort of starts with a hacker is doing recon against your network. Well, in a real APT, you have teams of analysts who are just learning about the people, the places, the behaviors of the people who work at a network. Yeah. And they're feeding that information down to an action arm. And that action arm is the cyber operator. So one of the goals of our product and what we're trying to do is to understand the, the, the intent because the intent is not the act of the hack. The hack is a process to answer a question that somebody's asked of them. I need you to go get in that network and give me knowledge about X, Y, and Z. Yeah. What is that? If we can learn that and secure that, well, you're you're giving them diminishing returns. You're not going to stop an APT from getting your network, but we can make it hard to get the value out of your network, and if, and, and that's our ultimate goal. Yeah, if you think back, as I, I like to use some movie analogies because most folks have seen some of these things, but if you, you go out of the cyber world back to the kind of physical spy versus spy stuff where you have a, 
Ronan, where like Robert De Niro yeah. standing in front of the hotel and he Classic. pushes the luggage cart over at to see how the security team around the the principal reacts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you're noticing recon on the edge of your network, they're doing that noisily on purpose. Right. Mm-hmm. If they were actually doing recon, you wouldn't see any of that stuff happening. Not from an advanced target. It, it's because they don't have to be in a hurry. They're going after if they're going after a specific target they'll take their time and they know through behavior patterns what will get caught and what won't get caught yep. um, and they can do their recon very slowly from a very large set of systems in a way that is not detectable by um, any tools now you may be able to go back afterwards you can go back and replay the whole world and you can and trace back through all the logs and be like oh man that's where they started doing recon from these 17,000 different hosts against us so mm-hmm. Uh, but you you won't find that on the way in. Um, it's very difficult, yeah. And and uh, the I think something that we learned coming out of the government and into the private sector, um, there's a lot of things we've been learning. But um, one of the main things is just the the kind of lack of awareness that this is going on, um, and that I think a lot of people that we've just talked to, just interviewed, you know, normal normal people, nobody nobody in particular, but a lot of people just have the misconception that. APT is happening. Um, it's either happening all the time, everywhere, and they're super paranoid, and they think everything is an APT, or there's people who think there's no way that an APT would want anything that I have, um, which may be the case, but that's not really a, uh, a reason why you wouldn't put a lock on your front door because you think you're not going to get robbed. Right? So, And that, I think that's kind of another thing I learned, too, is the difficulty of selling security products. It's like I don't want to I don't want to scare the crap out of people and say like there's all these <laughs> all these bad things out there you need to protect yourself but it's it's kind of like the the catch 22 is selling a security product or it, it feels like I'm selling like insurance yeah. like you know I don't you don't want to you don't want to scare people into buying a product but at the same time you need to you need to educate people and say like this is going on mm-hmm. no I mean um, in the the private sector side of the world sadly enough we in the security private sector have a, a term we call the burn victims um the most times the people all of a sudden allocate security budget and start buying things is after the first <laughs> yep. time something happens to yep. them yep. Uh, so it's like if you you look at the the credit reporting agencies now and there's one of them that had a really big incident in the last six months and they had both a, a technological failure um by not patching and updating some things they left some weaknesses but they also had a massive process failure because yeah. mm-hmm. databases should never be in production with default passwords on them like this is just and then sensitive information shouldn't be in a database with unencrypted tables so yeah. like there's multiple cascading things that happen there so like as you think about some of these hacks that that did not require an advanced Mm-mm. uh right. hacker to go in there this was a widely known exploit on and through to a system with default passwords through to a data store that then had no encryption on the information inside the table. So um, I'll bet though now is that they start to go back through and, and clean things up. Um, they're going to be buying lots of products. They're going to be buying lots of consulting services mm-hmm. over the next few years. Um, and their security is going to be um, significantly improved if yep. you, you come back a couple of years from now. But it will still take them a while to get from where they're at. Um, at that level of process failure and technological process, uh, just yeah. implementation failure. Yeah, well, that brings up a good point. Uh, a lot of products and a lot of services are sold at, you know, APT's sexy. Um, so that's what we want to market to. And uh, one thing we learned, uh, unfortunately, is that a lot, of, a lot of organizations struggle with the common security practices. Yeah. Encrypting databases, non-default passwords, log collection, uh, proper network segmentation. So there's a lot of fundamental things that are really hard to do right. And if and, and it costs a lot of money and you have to have the right skills and talent. And I think that's a, 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 a sad truth um, that that is occurring because that sort of drops the A off the APT. As long as somebody's persistent yeah. um, and they have time, they're going to uh, abuse that network. So you're, you're lowering the bar for anybody who cares to do their homework and, and you know, sit at home and get in the network and see what they see and take the time to research and move, they're going to be quiet enough that that network wouldn't ever see them. Yeah. And, and, uh, and many of them now are, they'll running, if they're not going after a specific target, so it's just targets of opportunity, their exploit tools will get in and then they'll sit and wait for six months or a year because they're not necessarily in a hurry. They don't believe you're going to clean it them out. And if they wait for six months or if they wait for a year, chances are they're going to be in all of your backups by that point mm-hmm. as well. Um, not very many folks run more than a one-year retention period on things. Um, and even if you do have a one-year retention period, if you had to go back and restore from a, a database a year ago and you have to look at all of the records that you're going to have to re-input, 
um, restoring from that one year ago back up pretty painful in a lot mm-hmm. of cases. So uh, you've just got to go in and clean that threat out of the active running system and cleaning those folks out. Um, not always the easiest, even for a not super sophisticated. Some of these um, root kits and tools out there now um, make cleanup uh, pretty complicated. So as, as you guys are, are going out now, as you said, you've built a product to deal with uh, some real complicated problems and finding out that folks don't have the, the basics. So this is like you, you've built a real-time security alarm and you realize folks don't have deadbolts on their doors right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, is as you you think about this do you try to go um change your product to try to help people have to or skip some of the hygiene that they're doing or do you try to just go sell to the the few hundred probably enterprises and and organizations that really understand um that they do need things like you've built or and some more advanced tools that's a very good question and sort of where we started off the product um, was, you know, like we said before, uh, understanding of the network and had, and that visibility. Uh, one of the things we developed was uh, packet tagging. So we employ uh, an encrypted uh, unique system identifier that's injected into every TCP and UDP packet. So as every host communicates on the network, every other endpoint can sort of validate their identity. So we've built, you know, uh, multi-factor authentication on unsecure protocols. So by doing that, if your network is unsegmented um, and you're not, you know, you didn't do some of those fundamental things, we're validating the true identity of hosts, and we can track track the communication of, of escalated privileges, users, what resources they're accessing. Because, like you said, you might have a database that's using default passwords, but we're going to see the attempt to connect to it, and we're going to see the attempt to bring down the data. That's going to be an alert and something we can say, okay, we're going to stop that now. Um, so that was sort of the impetus of why we went from for the network, sort of endpoint enabled network uh, analytics. Yeah. is what we're going after. I yeah. think uh, fundamentally, too, just from a company perspective, um, part of the reason we wanted to do it was to help help mm-hmm. out. Um, you know, it wasn't just about making a cool product and 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 that kind of thing, but it was also like, what can we do to kind of help the the security community build better tools? Because a lot of the stuff, the next gen, quote unquote. There's always a next gen every year, yeah. and it's never really that far of a step ahead. Um, so, what can we do to really advance, uh, you know, the next gen to get it to a new level where it's not just creating more alerts; it's actually helping people solve the problems instead of just, you know, creating the the log the alert fatigue that that everybody's mm-hmm. kind of facing right now. Yeah, well, and it, the alert fatigue is for the folks that even have staff to be able to yeah. handle that because like, we've uh, talked a a good amount about the uh, cybersecurity talent shortage out there across the U.S. We had um, Congressman Hurd on the program. Uh, he's working at the education level, but he's also trying to raise the alert around this, even at the the uh, congressional level there, um, that we have 200-plus thousand job openings today, I and that number's maybe closer, 500,000 a million. There's just many organizations that aren't posting a job because they don't believe they can get a qualified candidate. And as we, we look at where this is headed over time, um, the next few years, if certain tasks are not um, getting done in a more efficient manner um, by computers to then hand to knowledgeable professionals um, and eliminate a lot of the repetitive task work, mm-hmm. um, non-value-added task work that people are doing, um, there's no way we we s- scale that cyber workforce. And, uh, we're going to end up a million, two million, maybe three million people short by the middle of the next decade. Uh, so if you want to do a here the replay of our uh, conversation with Congressman Hurd or anything else that we talked about, cybersecurity education and workforce on CyberTalk Radio. Uh, our past episodes are available on our website at www.cybertalkradio.com as well as uh, iTunes podcasts or Pocket Cast or your favorite podcasting app on your Android devices. If you would like to look at a glorious still picture of us, uh, we'll be available on YouTube. and We have a YouTube channel as well. Uh, we do not do live video for the program. It's uh, much more fun uh, to just have a still black and white photo. I know I probably lose out on a lot of 10-year-old kids in the audience because they like to see live video on YouTube, um, but we're just going to have to deal with that. I've got my producer laughing. This is good. Uh, so we're going to uh, take a break here at the uh, bottom of the hour for some news, traffic, and weather. I think we'll come back and uh, have some fun maybe digging into uh, what does a, a real uh, a threat look like and, and how does you go through at this network level uh, to uh, detect some of these things in some more detail. You're listening to Cyber Talk Radio on 1200 WAI. Mm-hmm. 
Welcome back to Cyber Talk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, and I'm joined this week by Greg and Rob, uh, two cybersecurity experts that are uh, talking about uh, some more of the advanced and cutting edge uh, things happening in the cyber world. Uh, but guys, let's take this back for a minute. So if you were uh, out there in our listening audience and maybe you, you run a, uh, a medical group or maybe you're an IT guy and you've got a few hundred small business clients, uh, what things would you recommend everyone go take care of and uh, do to, to minimize this their chance that they're a target of opportunity? Because I think there's there's some things out there that are pretty easy, affordable, straightforward uh, that you just would be irresponsible not to go do. Yeah, that's that seems like an easy question, but that's a really it's a really wide question. I think uh, one of the things I've always told my mother-in-law whenever she asks me this question, like, what can I do to just protect myself um, is pretty much what everybody always says. And the cliches is just patch your software, make sure you're up to date. The newest uh, and latest is going to be the safest. Um, if you're running old software, especially if you're still running Windows XP or something like that, um, please buy a new computer for Christmas. That's, yes. that's if you're running Windows XP. If you have members of your family running Windows XP, laptops yes. are so, so inexpensive cheap. now. Yeah. Please buy them a new computer for Christmas. Even yeah, even getting to Windows 8. If you can't get to Windows 10, just do something newer. Uh, <laughs> that will will greatly increase your chances of of staying safe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, th I think a lot of people are coming up to that realization that um, whether they're targeted by APT or they're a direct attack, there's so much malware and there's so many tools out there that are designed to uh, automatically survey and exploit networks. Um, the best thing you can do. If you have customer data or you have data you want to protect, which most businesses do, encrypt that data, back it up. You know, Jungle Disk offers that service. I'll throw <laughs> you guys that bone there, but uh, yeah, you know, um, thank you. you. Um, but um, you know, you want you want to back up your data. You want to make it secure. You want to encrypt it. So in case if it is lost, it's not damaging to your brand and reputation. You've ensured the security of that information. Yeah. Beyond that, going into segmenting your network, um, I'm surprised at how many organizations have completely flat networks where. Um, you know, secretary at the front door's computer can directly see the CEO and CFO's computer. I mean, it takes nothing for me to walk in to the front lobby, drop a USB on the back of that while I while I talk to them, and walk out 30 seconds later, and I've got network access. Yeah. So, just the basics: secure your data, encrypt it. If that's all you're going to do, just encrypt your data. Make sure it's secure. So, um, on the encrypt your data, it's literally now as easy as going into your computer, right clicking kind of on your on a Windows computer, right click on that hard drive and click properties. And then there'll be a little checkbox there that says encrypt this drive. Um, same thing in the Mac OS. I'm not as familiar with where to go find it, but the operating system has default disk encryption built into it now. Yeah. Uh, if I'm on a, if, speaking of that, if, I, if I'm on a, a Mac computer, am I just hacker proof? So I think there's this, this image out there that if I'm on a Mac, I'm hacker proof. It's uh, ignorance is bliss, uh, safety in, in that realm. Um, a lot of people don't, uh, I, I guess this is very anecdotal too, and I can't tell you, I guess, more and more detail of it, but um, it is a very open system, and a lot of people rely on the, the hearsay that Macs are very safe because it's it one day came from Linux, so it's yeah. safe, um, but it is a... Uh, very accessible system just like Windows is and Linux is. And the only reason you don't hear more hacks is because there's about 10 users out there using them. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> so if, if uh, uh, desktop operating system, either you guys running Kali Linux for your main computer? I don't, I don't no. know. No. I run Windows and I run Linux and other stuff in VMs. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Windows 10, you know, the most up-to-date uh, version and it works yeah. for me. Yeah, I think looking at the Mac problem too, um, and not that Macs. I, I I like Macs myself. I have a few of them, um, and I think there's more than ten people using. I'm them. sure there's, <laughs> there's got to be fifteen. Yeah, 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 no, but you know, it's one of those things, and and, it, and it's a problem that the security realm has had too. And a lot of customers, well, I don't have alerts, so why do I need to buy a better product? And it's like your tools don't see it. Who who makes antivirus for Macs? Yeah, can we list any? Yeah, there's a couple. There's a there's a, yeah, yeah, there's a handful, handful. But like, you go ask a common person, hey, what's an antivirus for Mac? They're going to be like, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. You don't need one, right? Yeah. I don't hey, what's one. an antivirus for Windows? Oh, and, uh, you know, Avast, you know, uh, McAfee, and all, all the, the suite yeah. that you'd want to go through. You can put Kaspersky on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do that too. <laughs> yeah, you, you could. Um, I don't think you're going to hear anybody that's on this show today recommending it, <laughs> yeah. but you could. 
Um, and I mean, on the antivirus side, Windows Defender is built into the yep. Windows operating and it's system now. It's getting very good. Yeah, by please the way. turn it on um, mm-hmm. and update it. And it runs with Windows Update. It will get its own updates, and it does a a very solid job of being a baseline there. Um, I yeah, read so, an article recently that Microsoft said they had over 400 million deployments of Windows 10, and they're using all of that telemetry data, and they're building uh, a next-gen endpoint protection suite. So yeah. similar to the other guys, where they're going to do you know all the flashy AI machine learning stuff, um, which is great. That's you know a 90, 99 percent solution for you. Um, yep. and, yeah. and and I think they said they're giving it away with their Windows 10 licensing for businesses first and then rolling it out to customers for yeah. free, if I do recall. Don't, I th- yeah. don't put me on that. Yeah, go go look worth. online. Right. Uh, pick your favorite search engine. Go uh, look a little bit more about that. But, um, yeah, and when Windows Defender will not slow your computer down to a crawl anymore. Um, and if you go in there and you see that your Windows firewall that's also built into the operating system now, it's turned off and it won't turn back on. You probably are infected with something. Yeah, um, just throw your computer out the window. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> uh, not a happy day. Yeah. So if you're in there and you go and you try to turn that firewall back on or turn Windows Defender on and they won't turn on, you're already compromised. You are. You, there is a persistent threat on your system. May or may not be advanced. Probably not advanced. Um, and you need to do some things to uh, clean that out. So uh, go talk to a professional, or um, there's the other alternative of throw the computer out the window and buy a new one for Christmas. <laughs> yeah. I mean, worst case, go to the, your local Geek Squad and have them just reformat it, completely yeah. reinstall Windows. Uh, if you don't, if you know, and yeah. have a, a which, family tech guy that you can bother over Christmas to do it. I know, <laughs> which sadly, it'll work most likely, um, but maybe not, depending on what firmware and how old that computer is uh, yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. Um, it is. There could be bad, yeah, really bad stuff that gets into the network cards or into other um, aspects of uh, storable, writable information. Um, on that computer uh, these days. Um, there's even some non-volatile memory in a lot of video cards. There's lots of places that um, more advanced folks can store bad things. And then your computer may be clean again for a while, and then you boot up and use the 3D processing on that graphics card for the first time in a, in a, a while, and all of a sudden your computer's not running so clean anymore again. So see, see, this is this is what I mean about how quickly you can jump into the paranoia realm yes. and get your family like completely, you know, Deer eyed in in, yeah. in the conversation was like, well, they can persist in your router for your Wi Fi. They can persist in your printer. Yeah. <laughs> like, like they could live anywhere in your. They're they're watching you all the time. They are. And they are in Alexa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. So it's 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 very um, hard, I guess, for me to really keep a serious conversation when somebody asks me like, what are the what is like the worst stuff that you've seen out there. Yeah, and so I'm like, I don't want to tell you. I yeah. don't want you to know because you're gonna, you're yeah. gonna be like thinking every single thing out there is out there to get you. So if if I had a, if you you go uh, visit a family member here over the holidays, if they're running a uh, a Wi-Fi uh, access point at their house and and they're running on a WPA still, do you use that Wi-Fi or will you ask them to see if they could update that <laughs> or recommend they buy a new device for Christmas? Yeah, I think it's it's balancing your paranoia level. You know, uh, if anything, coming from where we come from, I, you'd think we'd be really paranoid. I just to the point where I'm just like, ah, no. I don't have the time. You no. know, I can't live with that paranoia in my life. No. So I'll go to Starbucks and get on that Wi-Fi. I'll live dangerously. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, if I'm at like a family member's house and it's WPA or something like that, that's fine. I mean, I'll definitely recommend you go to WPA2 and have a long password. But, I mean, the best you can do there is WPA2, keep a... 16 18 character password and change it every three months it sucks having to type it into all your devices but yeah that's really the best you can do if you unless you're going to go some enterprise grade solution which a home user is not going to do no yeah yeah and, and i mean there's there's other software solutions you can do like especially on your phones uh you can put a vpn on there mm-hmm. do something like that that no matter what wi-fi you connect to you just slide it over to the vpn mode and and yeah, relatively and, that, and that's safe. built into iOS for you Apple users out there and built into Android these days. You don't even need to install a third-party app yep. on there. Uh, many of these third-party VPN apps, um, especially in the Android uh, marketplace, um, do lots of data collection. So you might be not getting hacked by your uh, local hacker sitting on the Wi-Fi with right. you. Um, you just may be sharing all of your browsing information with a bunch of data merchants. So yes. be very um, careful with yeah. who you select to send your traffic to. I mean, yeah. if, for the advanced people, you can obviously set your own up at home and you know, bounce back to your home network. But uh, for the for the more layman, you know, 
yeah be careful with who you go with uh with vpn software yeah what about a what about a, a tor client um i i like, I like I, fast internet <laughs> yeah i i i i guess reserve judgment because um there could be similar arguments about tor and who owns the node the exit node and that kind of thing mm-hmm. but uh yeah, I mean, sure. If that floats your boat, I mean, it's safer than than going wide open on bareback on somebody's Wi Fi. <laughs> right. Yes, uh, but uh, I guess it depends on what what you're, you know, really concerned about and where you want to where you want to protect yourself. Um, you know, yeah. if you like Greg, uh, he's cracking up here. Uh, was talking about just segmenting stuff. You know, if you're doing. Um, you know, everybody's doing their banking and stuff on, on their computer these days, you know, keep that on a separate computer. Don't do that on your, your mobile phone. Don't do it on, yeah on a, on a machine that you also open up your shady ants email attachments on and things like that. So, 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 so let's say you guys are uh, just pretend for a moment you were traveling here over the holidays and you're walking through the airport and you see a USB laying on the ground and it's labeled Bitcoin wallet. Do you pick that USB up and plug it into a computer? Immediately. Immediately. Uh, I plug it into Rob's computer. <laughs> and I see how many loots I, I just acquired. Yeah. I mean, I would I would put it on my lab machine. Yeah, I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't put it on any yeah. sort of machine I cared about. Yeah. Let's, let's take a step back here. I would go to Lost and Found, and I would try to find the original owner of that USB because they're probably looking for it. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so for the <laughs> listeners that are uh, missing a little bit of our humor on that one, so uh, Google drop test or uh, USB malware. Um, so as uh, Greg was saying for a minute, it's like he could come in and talk to the front desk person. If he can plug a USB into that computer. He owns the computer at that point yep. or at mm-hmm. least virtual access to it. Um, and and so if you see a USB laying on the ground in a mm-hmm. parking garage, if you see a USB laying on the ground in an airport or anywhere else, please don't plug it into your computer. Um, I mean, for for companies too, like in, sitting in in your office, yeah. you see it on the ground. Like, don't plug it in and try to figure out whose USB drive it is. Yeah, you give it to an IT person or somebody. Mm-hmm. At least somebody who you yeah, think give it you to can somebody trust. with admin access. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't know any better. Maybe don't give it to like any <laughs> IT guy. You know, the the kid who's who's installing printers. Like, don't give it to him. But yeah, uh, you yeah. Know, yeah, don't don't plug it into your box and try to figure it out yourself because it could be there for a reason, a very specific I think, reason. I think all that does is highlight the value of abusing human trust. Yeah. Right? yeah. You know, you get to that point where it, ah, it's, I found it in the company space. It's cool. I know. I know, Tim, I'll plug it in. Boom. You know, that's all it takes. Yep. Yeah. So and and that's I mean, one of these things is uh, we talked at the start of the program uh, is that there's lots of not very sophisticated attacks that hackers are still using to mm-hmm. uh, compromise systems. Uh, and those not sophisticated entry points can end up in some sophisticated, hard to detect behavior afterwards. Um, and this is this real balance of like where and when and how um, do you deploy sophistication to keep yourself safe? And I think uh, the, the even the largest and most advanced enterprises are struggling uh, with with some of that aspect. So let's see, we're we're patching our stuff. We're getting on Wi-Fi, but maybe we're using a VPN. Mm-hmm. Um, we're turning on disk encryption in our operating system. We're turning on the, the built-in security stuff in the operating systems these days. Um, we're hopefully running a, a wireless router or access point at our house that can do WPA2. Um, so if, if uh, you don't know the difference between WPA or WPA2, you can probably log into your your router um, at, at your home uh, by going to your default gateway address. If you don't know what a default gateway is, there's a search engine to look some of that stuff up. You can go to there in a web browser and you should probably figure out how to log in. And if you haven't set a password on that Wi-Fi router, um, you can also look on your favorite search engine and find what the default ones are because chances yours is still running with that default. If your router came to you from your internet service provider, they may have set a password on it or they may be um, not doing a very good job as an internet service provider. There's a wide variety of them out there in the across uh, our country here in the U.S. And some of them uh, do a good job of changing passwords and some of them do not do a great job of changing passwords on the devices that they supply you. Um, so folks have gone in, you can, once you're logged into that web interface, you should be able to look and see what type of wireless uh, protocols your device is listening on and, and broadcasting out to the, the um, users that can come through and connect to it. Yeah, so here's, a, here's an old one. Um, if you've been in security circles for a while, uh, people used to say, you know, don't broadcast your, your SSID, don't broadcast your Wi-Fi name. Um, 
because if the hacker can't see it, then you're safe, right? Yeah, they, they won't they won't find you. Yes. Um, and a lot of a lot of people will still kind of bring that up with me, like I should I should hide it, right? So, but a hacker is using a tool that doesn't rely on your normal, you know, what your phone sees or what your computer sees. Um, whenever they run that scan, they're going to see the Wi-Fi name, no matter what you do to hide it. So it's not really worth the time and effort because some devices don't work when you hide it. You have to explicitly tell it. Uh, the name and things like that. So it just makes it harder on yourself. And, and don't worry about hiding your the SSID of the Wi-Fi access plane. Yeah, the 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 uh, the minimum requirements to secure things nowadays that everybody should be doing. What we said before is strong, good passwords and encryption. Everything should be encrypted. I mean, if you're doing that, you know, you're gonna you're gonna be far better off than you know WPA2 and my password's password. What's your password like, Greg? My password? <laughs> Let me tell you right now. Yeah, like passwords, and that's another misconception people have is what is a good password? Um, mm-hmm. It's this giant thing that's 20 characters long and has uh, special characters and numbers and whatever. You can't pronounce it. Um, but that's uh, that's not necessarily true. Uh, just the way that, that, the, that the letters and numbers are what's called hashed together or cryptographically hashed um, to generate what the computer actually is checking instead of the letters and numbers. Um, it doesn't matter really what you use. As long as you don't use something that you can, if you can find it in a dictionary, it's not a good password. Yeah. Um, or if it's in a, a kind of a combination that you can find in a dictionary, it's not a good password. But if you just make a small phrase um, and it's perfectly legible, you don't really need to use special characters or numbers, um, it helps because it kind of throws things off, but just making a longer password is better than a short password. Yeah, but don't pick the quick brown fox jumps over the, the <laughs> lazy dog. Yeah, yeah. well known phrases are not good, things but, like that. No, uh, but that something pass- is personal to you. Yeah, that password's infinitely better than a 12 character password with extra punctuation and right. sorts of things in it. And uh, NIST is actually, a, thankfully, finally, they've gone about updating that. Updating yeah. that. yeah. And has, over the, the last few years, uh, we've gone into this, well, passwords should be at least eight characters, maybe 12 or 16 or whatever it is now. Um, and they have to have at least one capital and at least one punctuation and at least one of this and has to start with that. And if you start going through from a math perspective, um, and you're you start, eliminating the you, odds. You start, yeah. yeah, you start actually lowering the entropy of that password and making it impossible to remember which is like why password managers are useful exactly um, in that sort of manner Uh, but from a a password manager perspective uh, be thoughtful and careful about the ones you're using there Uh, because if there's a centralized data store that has all of your passwords and all of a whole bunch of other people's passwords that's a high profile target that's that's one that's not just going to be a target of opportunity for some of those advanced threats those advanced folks will be going after um, anyone running a password management service that is keeping a centralized store of passwords that's accessible. Right. Um, yeah. If and you, not encrypted. <laughs> yeah. As some of the ones we've seen in the past. Yeah, it's not yeah. not good. Yeah, you should be, if, if you can find a password manager, find one where you can store the data locally on mm-hmm. your own machine encrypted with a passphrase that you know and you have to type in to decrypt them to then get access to some of those passwords for the individual systems. From a, a tech trends coming into to 2018 um, in this security world, so... Um, if I'm just got my own um, firewall, I've got an intrusion detection system. I've got quarterly vulnerability scans. Is that going to keep me safe through 2018, or um, are there things that uh, folks that are running a, a security operation should be thinking a little bit more about? Yeah, I think it just comes down to proactive analysis and not waiting. You know, the problem the the problem is we're just a reactionary type capability, and we talked previously about you know next gen. Next gen is just a counterpunch to a hacker's capability. That's all we're doing. We're, we're considerably reactionary. Even if we're saying our next gen is now predictive, it's you're, you're, you're predictive because you're trying to predict what somebody's already shown you that they can do. You're just predicting it in a new place. You're not really building out a new technology to, to, to handle that. And, you know, there's really not a lot of technologies that, that claim that or can do that really. So we need to be more proactive. We need to enable humans. And we need to enable humans with without showing them, um, it's hard, without showing them a deluge of data that's hard to put together. Too many products are dumping troves of data and and not providing the context needed to sort of put that picture together to say, well, this is what a real threat on our network looks like. What is our, how do we map our risk or acceptable risk to these logs? Um, and until we work at solving that, 
um, it, the hackers are going to keep having an advantage. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, the talent gap that we have, um, just finding somebody um, that ha- that that can wear all the different hats that is needed to um, be on the three man team in in a in a large firm that's trying to protect the giant network. Um, they're understaffed, underfunded, and they have to wear all these different hats um, because they can't, mm-hmm. you know, get other teammates. But even finding those people is difficult. So what? Why don't we work on tools and solutions that can wear some of those hats for these guys and provide a, kind of a boost up for them and provide that context, provide the, the the image of their network. A lot of people don't even know how many computers are on their network. You know, basic things. Uh, what versions are, are on the of, of the software are on the computers on the networks. Uh, so we can do that. We can, we have the technology uh, to do that. Why can't we build tools that provide better um, analytics, better visibility, dumb it down a little bit. You know, not everybody has to be a reverse engineer. Not everybody has to be a network analyst, Um, but everybody can kind of tell when something is bad. Uh, Humans are very good at seeing the patterns and know, knowing if something doesn't belong. Yeah. I I mean, that's interesting one is, as you mentioned, there's a, a, number of enterprises don't have an asset management yeah. system where they can yeah. track all of the versions of software installed on all the machines. So they even if they had somebody subscribing to a vulnerability disclosure list, they don't know if this is, and it's a high prior, a uh, remote ex, um, exploit. So this yeah. is a high high level risk vulnerability. They're not sure where inside of their systems, uh, inside their network, inside their business, that that high priority risk could be relevant or not. Right. We talked to... Um, a security analyst who was pretty high up in his organization, um, and he he told us a story. We were kind of just asking what his day in and day out is like, and aside from the alert fatigue of just having so many different alerts going off and not having the time in the day to even get through a quarter of them, um, he also told us a story about there was a server in their giant organization, a giant network that was that was hacked, and it was attacking. It was being used to attack another enterprise. Uh, and that enterprise called them and said, hey, you guys, you, this server is coming from your network. It's attacking us. And he couldn't find it. Like the network was so big and, and scattered throughout the world and, and there's so many different offices and, and networks. He couldn't find that server to yeah. turn it off and, and stop it from, you know, mm-hmm. from doing this stuff. And that's the kind of stuff uh, that I think these really next gen things are, are missing. It's like the, they're simple problems that need to be solved before we get into machine learning and predicting the future of, of zero day exploits. Uh, there are simple problems we can solve with just better data, yeah, yeah, and a complete picture. So, because if you don't have a, this is maybe what some of the hackers should go into is just uh, actually go do an, an asset catalog and then <laughs> offer to sell that back to the business. Right. <laughs> Here, yeah. Here's a complete network map. Yeah, right. Here's a complete <laughs> updated network map. Here's all the software versions installed on your systems. Oh, by the way, we've patched all of these, but I've left my remote management software on there. Right. Black Hat <laughs> IT services. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's there are some that try that. Um, yeah, where they're like, we've patched everything and we'll leave your system for a certain amount of money. And if not, then we're just going to format everything. That mm-hmm. one happens every once in a while. But now they're just going with the encrypting ransom where it's just so much more efficient uh, for them to just target of opportunity and hit a whole bunch of people for 500 bucks because it's really difficult to investigate that. I mean, the power of the bot, Matt, which is why you yeah. know, I picked that analogy was um, it's so easy to do it. I mean, it's so easy to control it. Uh, you know, a, a one person can control hundreds of thousands of computers, um, why aren't we doing that on the defense side? Why are, why are we letting the Mirai botnet and all these other things that are so capable of taking down other systems and doing different things in a very organi- organized uh, kind of hive mentality, Yeah, we can leverage that on the defense side and use uh, the organization, we give the organization the power to do what they want with their own personal defensive botnet. Um, and the name Phalanx, like, you know, the movie 300 or, you know, if people aren't yeah. organi- or familiar with that term. Um, it's the Greek where they, everybody had their shields together. Um, and that's that kind of network swarm mentality of everybody's defending. Um, if one goes down, the next guy steps up and puts his shield up. Like, that's kind of the image that we want to give with, with Phalanx. Uh, thank you all for coming on here. And I uh, wish everybody a, a happy holidays here and a, and a good, safe new year. Um, don't get yourself hacked in 2018. So we'll, uh, we'll be online here before the end of the year, though. So you'll be able to find it on our website at www.cybertalkradio.com.